What you're going to hear about tonight are, um, are descriptions of two major developments in the therapy of cancer that depends on many years of, of fundamental research. Uh, you're going to hear from Chris about uh, what we call targeted therapy, the use of, uh, of drugs and other therapeutic modalities to uh, try to specifically reverse the, the damage to cells that results in cancer. You're going to hear from Jed about what we call immunotherapy, uh, a form of therapy that uh, attempts to utilize the powers of our own immune system to control the growth of cancer cells. Both of these are in incredibly important, powerful themes in our understanding and treatment of cancer. Uh, but let me say a few things about this, just to place it in perspective. First, they're going to talk about recent work, no doubt. But everything that you hear is based on decades of fundamental work that is directed toward trying to understand cells, how they work, how the immune system functions, and other things. Secondly, much of what they have accomplished and the, the colleagues who work in these two areas have accomplished has depended very heavily on the development of new technologies <coughs> that are rooted in fundamental research that may not appear at first glance to be about cancer. Uh, both targeted therapies and immunotherapies have their shortcomings, which it's our job to try to, to, try to uh, confront. The fight that we are trying to wage is not going to be uh, resolved quickly. The years that we need to devote to try to understand this incredible threat to human health, um, human health both in the U.S. and frankly around the world, because cancer is causing increasing numbers of deaths in the developing world as well as the developed world. But this long-term uh, effort that we're, that we're all making is one that can only succeed with talent and money. And uh, I'm a public guy. I've worked at the NIH several times. And uh, uh, I believe that public funding of research is important. But private funding is equally important. And the kinds of things that Damon Runyon and many other uh, cancer funding agencies do is critical to the success of this enterprise, which I believe is showing many signs of success that were not apparent to me in 1970 when I began working on this problem. Uh, the, the terrain has changed. Clinicians and, and basic scientists are able to talk to each other and, and with a fluency that wasn't available uh, 30 or 40 years ago when I began doing my own work. There are many ways to treat cancer. Um, and for many years, we focused on the tumor and how to get the tumor to get smaller um, or to remove it. Flash forward to 2013, when cancer immunotherapy finally emerged from being classified as speculative science um, and really mythology to be termed by Science Magazine as the breakthrough of the year. And I'm not going to trouble you with all the science. Again, I'm going to tell you how this is like transportation. But PD-1 stands for Programmed Death Molecule Number 1. Now, if you're a patient, that's really what you want to hear, that your drug is called Programmed Death. Right? But really, what this molecule controls is the death of immune cells. And by interfering with it, it allows immune cells to stay alive longer and do their job fighting the cancer. And this is just a CAT scan showing that we made all the orange arrows go away. Right? Um, this is pretreatment. The orange arrows are pointing to tumors. Um, and these all regressed by the time of the first scan three months later. We moved this forward into a phase three, a large worldwide trial, which compared the two component parts to the combination. And we actually showed that almost 60% of patients treated with this combination of two immunotherapies had a significant shrinking in the size of the tumor. It's not 100%. Not all of these responses are durable, but many of them are. The fundamental underlying problem with prostate cancer is that it's a very clinically heterogeneous disease. There are very indolent or slow-growing cancers that really may never hurt a guy during his natural lifetime. And there can be a very uh, fast-growing, aggressive disease that can rapidly progress. And we don't do a great job of telling one from the other. And so that leads to the central problem that some guys do very well and some guys do very poorly. And that's across every stage of the disease, from the first diagnosis to metastatic treatment-resistant disease. State-of-the-art DNA sequencing has caused a real revolution in our understanding in this disease and really all, all diseases.
One of the things that has been, we've learned a dramatic amount about in the, again, the, just the past five years, is how important DNA repair is in prostate cancer. And so all of our DNA, as our cells are dividing and growing, is being used, it's being broken, it's being taken apart and put back together again. In prostate cancer, what we found now is that mutations in the genes that actually encode the, uh, the machinery that does this repair is very commonly mutated. Guys that have metastatic treatment-resistant prostate cancers, about 12% of them have hereditary mutations in DNA repair genes. These genes are pretty much the same genes that are contributing to the risks of ovarian and breast cancer in women. They're the same types of DNA repair genes. So in terms of what does that actually mean and how is that beneficial, well, first of all, in terms of knowing that you may have a DNA repair defect that you can pass on to your kids, that's obviously something that uh, most men would want to know. But secondly, in terms of our understanding of how these systems work actually allow us to, uh, to target them.